day it is. Great day because we celebrate a Savior who is not dead. He is very much alive. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. I wonder if there's anybody who came excited to worship the Lord today.
Good morning, and friendship. Good morning. Happy resurrection day. God is good. Here we all stand for the reading of God's word. I'm reading from Psalms 27, verse 1 and verse 4. It reads, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Verse 4 says, One thing I have desire of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the yeah. Lord yeah. all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple, yeah. his church. Yeah. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray. Lord, again, we say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for another day you have kept us, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for coming here, Lord. Be born of a virgin, Lord. To save our souls, Lord. To die and to rise again. And you're coming back, Lord. You're coming back for your children. We thank you, Lord. What better day to say thank you for all you've done on Resurrection Sunday, Lord. We say thank you, Lord. You didn't have to do it, but you did, Lord. We say thank you, Lord. You're so great, Lord. Lord, we just want to say thank you. Thank you, Lord, for waking us all up, bringing us to your house. To praise your holy name, Lord. We say thank you for our pastor, Lord. Bless him and keep him, Lord. Time to preach the word, Lord. We pray for Sister Tracy, Lord. Lord, we pray for our seniors, Lord. We pray for the ones that's here, the ones that's absent. Lord, we pray for our sick and our shut-ins, Lord. Lord, wherever they may be, Lord, we ask you, Lord, to bless them and keep them, Lord. Heal their bodies if it be your desire, Lord. Lord, we pray for the middle-aged people of our church and of this world, Lord. We pray for the baby boomers, Lord, because that's the greatest population there is right now. Lord, we pray for them, Lord. We pray for the young people. We pray for the youth. We pray for the ones in school. We pray for the ones in college, Lord. Lord, we say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the sunshine. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for allowing us to see another day. Who else could lay us down last night and rise us up this morning but you, Lord? Lord, we say thank you, Lord. We pray for this waiting congregation, Lord. We pray for this choir. We pray for these musicians, Lord. We pray for churches that's open in your name all over the world, Lord. Lord, again, we say thank you for another day. Thank you, Lord, for all your many blessings, Lord. We ask you, Lord, to continue to protect us all from all hurt, harm, and danger, sicknesses, diseases, and viruses, Lord. We pray no one better than you, Lord, can help us, Lord, at this moment. We pray for this world, Lord. We pray for the destruction that's going on all over, Lord, the illnesses, the sicknesses, the viruses, Lord. Only you, Lord. Only you. We've been in this pandemic for over three years, Lord, but you brought us through, Lord. We're just going to need and depend on you that you will carry us through, Lord. If there is if there is a reason for us to get a shot every year for this pandemic, Lord, at least you have provided it for us, Lord. Lord, and we should be the willing participants to take it. Because what you've done, Lord, for the doctors to provide it is only good for us, Lord. Again, Lord, thank Thank you, Lord, for another day. Lord, we ask you all these blessings in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen and amen and amen.
muncul. Dan Now that we were good enough, now that we were worthy, he made a decision. And he never regretted it. We made some choices and we wish we could go back and do them all over again. But I'm glad that Jesus didn't change his mind. I'm glad Jesus, even in the garden of yesterday, he was at a place where he said, Father, let this cup pass from me. But then he said, but not, not, not what I want. Not my will, but your will be done. Die in your place in life. Die so that we who were there could be delivered. Die so that we who were children of disobedience now become children of obedience to the God of our salvation. He is worthy to be praised. Can we give and clap of praise. Now, if you really, if you really can, God, you do. You throw it in your hand and clap. Have to call the Lord. This is what I say while I'm in the appreciation. I'm fanning out. But I'm, I'm also fanning in the state dead. He is alive. That's why we sing that great hymn of the church on hymn number 102. He lives. I'm going to ask that he would stand. Let us sing that hymn with excitement and volume and voice today.
But we can't have a good Friday without an Easter morning. And so on this celebrated day, I ask that you would turn with me to your, in your Bibles to Paul's letter to the church at Corinth, that controversial church. Chapter 15, verse 3 through 8, and then verses 12 through 17. This is the one chapter out of all of Paul's writing where he spends an entire chapter defending, arguing the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And when you find it, would you say amen? I'll be reading out of the English Standard Version of the Bible. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to see then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep or died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Verse 12 through verse 17. Now, if Christ is proclaimed, is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are found to be missing representatives representing, misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. Verse 17. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is in vain of fuel and you are still in your sins. I want to talk about why the resurrection matters. Why the resurrection matters. There's a question that I raised and I pray with God's help with your prayers that we will seek to, to find an answer for it's already been answered. It's already as Sister Hubert would say it's already in the book. <laughs> Many of us in this room, and those of you that are watching, know something about a place that can be very uncomfortable, unwanted, undesirable, and yet real. Yeah. A place where questions are raised that immediately we don't have answers to. Called a crossroad. That place where you've got to decide where you either go left or right, forward or backward. That place, figuratively speaking, that says that you've got to make a decision. Not always comfortable, not always what you want, not always what you want to conclude, because no, no one who is at a crossroad desires to make the wrong turn. No, no one at a crossroad want to go in the wrong direction. And, and it's amazing for those of us that are people of poetry, Robert Frost, who wrote a poem, The Road Not Taken, in his last line of his poem, says something very profound that I believe will help us. He writes, two worlds diverge in a wood, and I took the one less traveled. That has made all of the difference. Let me let you hear it again. 
Two roads diverge in a wood. And I took the one less traveled, and that has made all the difference. It's amazing how when you look at the last line of his poetic statement, and that has made all the difference. For many of us in this room, we would say, you're talking about me. Because it sums up where many of us are today in our lives, in our decisions, in where life is going, what we see right now, what, what we've got to deal with, things that we've got to work our ways through, that, that, that has made all the difference. Well, I, 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 let me pull from that poetic line and allow me to connect with what Paul is saying in this text. Because when it comes to the resurrection of Jesus, it has made all the difference. Yeah. Oh yeah, we all have some crossroads that we face. But can I tell you that the most important crossroad that you ever face in your life is the decision to either believe or not believe whether the resurrection of Jesus Christ is true. Yeah. And, and, and at that point, if I may insert right here, that, that you don't just believe it's true, but you come to know that you commit all that you are, all that you trust that it is true. I want to say early on that the resurrection is either a hoax or it is history. It's either fact or fiction. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and Savior, has made it clear by an empty tomb that he has proven that he is alive. Uh, it wasn't a swoon theory, as some, some would say, where he went into some kind of comatose state, and because of the coldness of the tomb that he was revived, no, no, Jesus died. No, it, it wasn't the wrong tomb theory as some would suggest, presupposing that when the women went there to anoint his body for burial, not looking for a, re a risen Lord, that they went to the wrong tomb. No, that, that, that's not correct either. It's not even true when many who are philosophical in their thinking and yet near atheistic in their belief would say that it was the hallucination theory. That they were, but I don't know what they might have been on, but there are those who say that Jesus really didn't get up bodily, but that there was some mirage, some hallucination. They thought they saw him, but it really wasn't him. Well, I want to put all of that to rest. In fact, I got the Bible to help me. And I believe there's at least eight saints in the house who can stand with me to say that that wasn't a hallucination, it wasn't the wrong tomb theory, and it wasn't the swoon theory. Jesus got up. Jesus is alive and well. Yes, he is. But when, Paul, but when Paul stands before those who are second-guessing the reality of the cross, Paul makes it clear by those who are the th great thinkers of his day, those Athenians, those yeah. Greek scholars, those Greek philosophers, even those on Mars Hill who would want to establish a statue to the unknown God, Paul makes it clear that Jesus is alive. Yes, if Jesus is truly risen from the dead, and he is, then it stands as the most important fact in all of history. But that's not all. Because we need to understand that there are some tremendous consequences that hang on your response and mine when it comes to the resurrection. And therefore, let me share with you as we get ready to move into the message today that it is extremely important on this celebrated Easter Sunday, but not just today, but every day of your life, that you understand why the resurrection of Jesus matters. And it was this kind of thinking that Paul had to face when he wrote this chapter. Yeah. Let me share with you at least three pivotal points I believe are present and pregnant in this passage that are going to push us forth in understanding why the resurrection matters. Are you walking with me? Yes, sir. Resurrection matters, first of all, because it confirms the person of Jesus Christ. Yeah. It confirms who he was. He, this is not mistaken identity. Yeah. The fact of the matter is, is that when you were to walk through the Gospels, 
you will discover that at his baptism by John, that the claim was made by John, behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. I believe there was Christian apologists who made it clear that Jesus, yes, C.S. Lewis is his name, said that Jesus must either be a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. Well, I can, I can get rid of two of them. He ain't a lunatic, he ain't crazy, and he surely ain't a liar. But I know that he is a Lord. Oh, he's definitely Lord. Oh, boy, yeah, he's definitely Lord. Now, y'all can be lying here early and calling him. There, 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 was, there was nobody like Jesus. Nobody was born like Jesus. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's called the Immaculate Conception, where God had allowed a virgin to get pregnant by the agency of the Holy Spirit, who never had physical relations with a man. And, and, and thank God today that if you're going to believe he was born like he was born, how could you deny believing he died like he did the man he lives like he lives? Nobody died like Jesus. But let me also heard you say nobody was raised or resurrected like Jesus. But not only that, nobody was born like him, nobody died like him, nobody was raised like him. But can I also add, there's nobody coming back like Jesus. Three times in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus announced his death and his resurrection. He first talked about it in Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, where it reads, From that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed. Here it is. And on the third day, he raised. Ah, oh, bless his holy name. The second time Jesus foretold his death and resurrection, it occurred in Matthew chapter 17 and verse 22 and verse 23. It says, as they were gathering Galilee, Jesus said to them, the disciples, the Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. But that ain't the only other time Jesus foretold his death and resurrection. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 17 through 19, as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the disciples with him, and on the way, he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes. They will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. But he didn't end there. And he not might, not could, not should. And he we yes, be raised. Yeah. Oh, y'all don't know the shot. Stop it. Yeah. Yeah. On the third day, yeah. Jesus had to die. Yeah. Because without his death, we would have remained hopeless and helpless. He had to die. Yeah. Had he not died, would we still be eternally doomed without a way back to God? But most importantly, as Paul points out in verses 3 through 5, Paul says, in accordance with the scripture. Yeah. In other words, it is biblically fulfilled. In other words, if Jesus is still dead, are y'all walking with me? Yeah. Then God and the Bible cannot be trusted. Yeah. I often hear the critics who want to talk about, well, there's a man-made book. No. It is divinely inspired. God breathed. God used human people in order to write what he won't read. Y'all still ain't catching this. Praise God today that if he is still dead, Paul says, and he even raises it, he says that our preaching is in vain. That includes your singing. That includes our teaching. That includes our testimony. And he says that our faith is in in vain. But then it goes on to say that we would be found false witnesses misrepresenting. In other words, we would be lying on God, testifying about something God did that never did come to pass. Well, brothers and sisters, not only does Paul help us in this text to deal with the confirmation of the person of Jesus, but can I show you secondly that the resurrection confirms the promises of Jesus. Yeah. He's never made a promise that he did not fulfill. Yeah. 
I ain't never got to worry about Jesus lying, having an inflated ego. I never have to worry about Jesus saying something that he cannot do or perform. Testimony concerning what Jesus declared about God and himself, you need to know is accurate and reliable. His message was divine. Its source of origin was God. In John chapter 12, verse 49, Jesus himself says, For I did not speak on my own, but the Father who sent me commanded me to say all that I have spoken. Yeah. Somebody heard him talk one day, but turn, and they were so mind blown by what he said. He said, Never man spoke like this man. Never before, God have we preached today. Never again would a man influence the world as much as Jesus of Nazareth. Something about his eloquence, something about his wisdom, his mercy, his grace, his words were never equal in history and never will be equal again. And after hearing him teach, brothers and sisters, somebody had to say that there was never a man anywhere that ever talked like him. Hey, now, now, we weren't just caught up in talking. Jesus was doing some stuff. Yeah. Never anybody could do what Jesus did. Yeah. Oh, oh, yes, I know, I know he did some great things. Never could anybody walk on the water like Jesus did. Yeah. Nobody could take two fish and five loaves of bread and feed more than 5,000 men and women and children and then pick up 12 baskets of leftovers. Hello, over here. Heal like Jesus. No, no, nobody could preach like Jesus. Nobody could pray like Jesus. Lord, help me preach your words today. Yes, in Matthew chapter 8, verse 8, Jesus can encounter the centurion officer that came to him seeking the half of a sick soldier and yet feeling inadequate to have Jesus come to his house. He said, Lord, I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. But I believe that you got power not just in your presence, but even in what you say. All you got to do is just speak the word. And I believe my servant will be healed. Oh, come on. I mean, you're talking about the man that had a centurion servant. We're talking about some folks sitting up in here right now. The Lord has been good to us. And we didn't have to always worry about him touching him. Anybody you ever had to talk to you? Calm them down when your fears were at their height. Am I talking to anybody in here? Who ever had the Lord to talk to you in moments of despair and disappointment and disgust? When you wanted to throw, to throw in the towel, the Lord let it be known. No, I'm with you. And I'm going to tell somebody in here who don't know him, you need to get to know him. Oh, yes, I've got to have some children in here. They ain't got no problem justifying. I've been with them a long time. And I'm not tired yet. I, I, I know he can do only what the Lord on that roof is proved. Yeah. Don't, don't get it twisted. It's not the doctor. It's not medical technology. It's not the medicine. Thank God for all three of them. But I want to tell you that it is nobody, nobody. Today, I'm the time that I still came to preach. 
somebody you need to get to know. He is somebody you need to trust.
then my preaching right now is a waste of time and it's worthless. How do you know he said? He said because our preaching would be in vain, which is another way of saying it's empty. If Jesus is dead, there is no substance of the gospel and there is no substitute if he ain't raised. If Jesus is dead, I didn't say he is, that's it, but if he is, Paul says, if he is, then Christianity takes its place among other powerless religions and ethical systems. If Jesus is still dead, then we are no better than those of other Near Eastern and Far Eastern religious beliefs. Confucius died still dead. Muhammad died still dead. But I know that there was a Jesus who died, ain't dead. He's alive forevermore. If Jesus is dead, then we are wasting our time being in here today. And not only that, but you got to ultimately throw out the entire Bible if Jesus is not raised from the dead. Because if he is dead, it would discredit those who did write the word of God. Yeah. Paul, don't stop there. Paul, oh, you made it real hard on me today. Paul says, I got a second defense yeah. concerning the truth and the accuracy of the resurrection. Yeah. He says that if he's dead, then believing the gospel is worthless. Yeah. If if he's still there, we might as well go back out to the street. Club hop. Do everything else we were doing before. Because after all, if he's dead, what's all this church going to do? But Paul makes it clear, don't go out to know yet. Stay with me. Paul makes it clear that apart from the reality of the resurrection, faith is no good. Have you heard a statement now, by people who, who, uh, who, who say that it, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe. Uh, don't buy into that madness. You better know why you believe what you believe. I was reading, riding down the street a few days ago. I saw a bumper sticker. that had all kind of religious symbols that were on it. And they spell, these symbols are spelled out coexist. No, I, I, I stand to let it be known that I'm a Christian, yeah. I'm ashamed of it, and I'm glad about it. Yeah. I don't make apologies yeah. for believing in the cross. Yeah. I don't make no apologies for believing he was God's son. Yeah. I don't make no apologies for believing that he died for my sin. Yeah. I don't make no apologies yeah. for him being my Lord and Savior. Because if Jesus didn't die on the cross for our sin and rise again on the third day, triumphant over the forces of evil and death, hell, and the grave, let me say it again, if Jesus is not risen, then the gospel is worth it. Believing the gospel is a waste of time. And understand that it's all a waste. But I want to tell you, before you get up out of your seat, before you close your Bible to say no, uh -uh. It is the infallible and the inerrant word of God. God's word is real. God's word is true. Oh, yes, it is. But then, here it is. 
confirms. You might want to put your hand up under your seat on this. The power yeah. of Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 I don't know about y'all. And I believe he's got all power. Not some, not a little bit, but all. Oh, yeah. I, I sound like he got some children in the house. Oh, yeah. He's got all power in his hand. Want you look at somebody and tell them he's got all power in his hand? He's got power to lay his life down. And he's got power to pick it up again. I don't know about y'all, but that, 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 you should have talked about somebody who is in complete control. I don't know anybody other than Jesus who can say, I can lay my life down when I get ready. Christ is right, I know he did. Because when they talked to him on the cross about he died in his little transliteration of the original language, it says he pillowed his head like somebody that was getting ready to go to sleep. And Brother Baker, last time I checked folk who go to sleep and tend to wake up. And Jesus did all of that. Oh, yes. I believe that he is the one and true God. And, and, and I believe, based on the conviction of verifiable facts and historical truth, that Jesus actually literally physically rose from the dead. I agree with John Irving, who once said that anybody can be sentimental about the nativity, about the little angel sin, and any fool can feel like a Christian at Christmas. But Easter is the main event. Oh, yes, it is. Jesus didn't just come to be a cute baby and man in a feeding trough. He came to die. Oh, yes, he did. I'm thankful that Easter is the main event. And if you don't believe in the resurrection, then you need to know that you ain't been born again. If you can believe that he was born of a virgin, performing miracles, that only God can do that. He was son of God. Then believe in the resurrection shouldn't be a problem for you. The resurrection of Jesus Christ isn't something that's true for some, but not for others. It's like the law of gravity. You help me, Brother Norm? You don't have to believe in gravity in order for it to be true. Gravity is true whether you believe it or not. It's true whether you trust it or not. That there is good news beyond the death of Jesus. A cross that looked like to many that had taken him out and for some was the end of the story. But praise God that it wasn't the end of the story. Thank God today that what looked like to many to end his life, the resurrection marks the undefeatable, undeniable, unconquerable, and unbeatable power of our God. On one occasion during a moment in which some of the religious leaders tried to corner him in a conversation, he told them, destroy this temple, and in three days, I'll raise it up again. Jesus had power. I thought he had somebody in here who said amen. He had power beyond their comprehension and beyond their ability to figure it out or fathom it. He was the only person who could predict his death and resurrection and make it happen just like he said. Oh, bless his holy name. The power of Jesus was seen in the miracles he performed. And surely if he could raise Lazarus, what about his own son? If he could raise the widow man's son, what about himself? And can I tell you today, don't worry about it. He's got it covered. Amen. It's like my nephew Tommy said, hey, Uncle Rev, I got you. And Jesus would say to all of us, I got you. I, I know that you worry about some things, but I got you. Remember who we're talking about. The Son of God became an enemy of God while making us children of God. You still ain't catching what I'm saying. The Son of God who took on the sins of, I, of you and I. And the Father turned his back on him. And that's why he cried from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But bless his holy name, he was dressed like a sinner while the Son of God in order that you and I might become the children of the Most High God. And that's what Calvary and the resurrection is approved and provided for us. 
the resurrection, not only validate God's supreme power over death, hell, and the grave, but it also sends a clear and important message. Heaven help me just a little while as I preach your holy word. Since he rose from the dead, here it is, brother Norm. We ought to be able to shout on this if you didn't shout on nothing else. And that is that we are not believing in vain. That even though this work the house or tabernacle will one day dissolve. Paul said that I got another building of God in heaven. Yes, not in Warren, not in Cleveland, not in Atlanta, not in Cincinnati, not in Columbus, but I got another building made by God eternal in the heaven. In this body, we get old and feeble. In this body, we get weak and worn out and worn down. But don't worry about it, beloved. We got another building of oh God.
Be 